Okay. Did you see Daniel Craig host Saturday Night Live last night? Yeah, not even he can save that show. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was one funny part. They kind of did they kind of did one of their pre-filled segments of their made-up James Bond movies. With that was the good. James, that I got to give. The James that Bond girl that that didn't make it. it. Like Penny Marshall was one of Dude, the Bond Dude, that Penny Marshall girls. one was sick but funny, man. <laughs> but that was. And, and one of the my, the one part of it that made me laugh out loud was one of the made-up titles for the Bond movie was. Hippopotapussy. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Anyway, it is the as we all know, because uh, we've been inundated with it. The Bond box set came out this week, and we've had lots of articles and popping up about the 50th anniversary of the James Bond film. So I thought we'd go through our list tonight, ranking the 22 James Bond movies. Uh, using Entertainment Weekly's list. Oh, okay. They, oh, they have a. When did it, when did this list just come out with a new issue? Yeah. Or, okay, we haven't yeah. gotten. I haven't gotten that in a mail yet. Okay. From worst to best. Okay. So let me ask you guys: What do you think is the all-time worst Bond movie? Oh God. Moonraker. Um, yeah, Moonraker. I have to say it's like Moonraker, and I would have to say Moonraker just because it's just so. Um, I mean, it's fun. It's that's ironically the first one I saw in the theater. But as you get older, it's just the, it's one of the cheesiest ones. It's completely silly. But now, is it now? Let me let me say this though. To Bond's credit, even Bond at its worst is so much better than a majority of action films. I'm sorry. This is they, true. This they is follow true. a specific formula. My dad said it best. So the best part of these movies is when they blow up everything at the end. I, I mean, so he's got a point there. I love idea. the tradition of Bond. I love yeah. opening with the opening with the over the top action sequence, then going into the song and the credit sequence, and then usually Bond movies die for me after they show the devices. You know, after M shows them the gadgets, about you know a quarter of the way through it. Usually they lull for me, and then they, they, they close. Do. Then they close well. You but know? yeah, no, no, they they do, and I think you're absolutely right. But I actually think another one that, as time goes by, that may prove to be is Quantum of Solace doesn't work after its bang up opening. It wants to be so many things, and at the end of the day, it's really just an extended third act of the previous no. film. That's and I think they, I think they know that. I yeah, think they're trying to. I think that's what they're trying to make up for for this new one. Well, they're, well, we'll see. I mean, you know, he has, you know, this film has the, it's the, and it looks good. Don't get me wrong. It ha, I mean, everything leading up so far gives me an indication this is like, like a really a good film. Um, hopefully, um, but it does have the. It has to really live up to all this hype being the 50th year and everything, and you have a film coming out and. Everything. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be good. I mean, the people behind it are just extraordinary, from the technical to in front of the I camera. I think this is the most. <clears throat> let's be very honest. With all the directors they've had, they had some very good directors, but this is the most like, how should you say it? Original director. Like, yeah, and, and director so that was the big curiosity. Had. That was the big curiosity. But then with Sam Mendes directing it, but then when you saw the trailer, I was surprised. I thought. This does look like a Bond movie. I mean, this looks like a kick-ass Bond movie. This yeah. doesn't look like Reservation Road or Revolutionary Road or whatever yeah. that movie was. Yeah, this no, doesn't take place Road, in the kitchen, yeah. you know. No, no, it, 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 it looks good. Um, <laughs> they they agree with you guys. Their worst Bond movie ever is Moonraker. Mm-hmm. Mm. At twenty-one, <clears throat> worst Bond movie. Die Another Day. I would. I was going. Yeah, I, I agree would, completely I agree with, with that. With this so far, two or two for two. Followed by Quantum of Solace. Wow, this is did we write? Did they like this go into my? Is it, did they do it perform Inception and go into my mind to get this list? <laughs> well, and you know Daniel Craig. I mean, the makers of Quantum of Solace even admit, you know, that movie's a mess. We did not have a script when we had to start shooting, you know. Mm-hmm. So we we weren't at the top of our I, game. I actually think that film also makes a, a another big mistake though. They like, introduce. Which is, I guess, they wanted to try to make this like 21st century version of Spectre, Quantum, and and then they don't do anything with it. It's sort of like, okay, we introduce this whole thing, and then they drop the ball like halfway through the movie. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, forget about it. <laughs> They're number 19. The world is not enough. You know, I don't remember much about the world is not enough. It's not a good movie. But I will say uh, that she has to be one of the worst Bond girls ever. I mean, Denise I, Richards I is attractive. That. I give you that. I give you the unfortunate thing that 
it, The World Is Not Enough should have been one of the best Bond movies because that's the Bond family crest. The World Is Not Enough. That's what they're. That's in the you know Honor Majesty Secret Service. That's what we learned that in Latin. You know, the world is not enough. Is the, the family motto when they're doing this thing for his. Um, to infiltrate Blofeld's organization. And you're like thinking, okay, you're giving it the film this title. Let's make it mean – let's give the movie some weight, some – no, no no such luck. I mean, Denise Richards playing a nuclear scientist. I mean uh... – <laughs> I'd rather see – I'd have better – I'd better believe um, – Casey Lane as a um, nuclear scientist before Denise Richards. Sorry, you know her 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 plastic boob surgeon could have been a nuclear scientist, but uh, yeah, I don't I mean, think but, that. Uh, it's, it's just not happening. No, These, I agree with this list. It's so too far. bad they can't go a list with uh, with doing some of the Bond women, and, and I mean they very rarely do. There's the occasional you know Halle Berry or something like that. Well, no, they, the best Bond girl of all time is a list. Uh, Diana Rigg. Yeah, exactly. she is the she is the best. I mean, you don't you. Will, I I hate to say we'll never have another Bond girl quite like that. Yeah, well we could, but, uh, but it's not gonna it's just not, not gonna be. happen. Yeah, they're number eighteen. You only live twice. Mm, I I. This is good. <laughs> this is a I, I enjoy they that remade movie. this one so many times. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Spy Who Loved Me is a remake of this, and Never Say Never Again is, you know, it's really interesting. There's a whole thing. They're just trying to make another. Um, they try to remake this all the time, but the, they want to remake. They wanted to make it with Pierce Brosnan or Timothy Dalton Warhead, like Len Dayton and Len Dayton had written the screenplay. But you only live twice is very interesting because Sean Connery left the franchise initially because. The spoof Casino Royale with Peter Sellers grossed more money than this, and he was furious. He mm-hmm. was just like, I can't believe the spoof made more than our movie. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the best Bond song while we're taking a break from the list? Uh, mm. Goldfinger. I, I would say Goldfinger, um, but I also might have to go with Louis Armstrong. We have all I the do time love in the that. world. I love that sequence. I, I I love that sequence, but it's weird. It's not, it's not the Bond song that's front and center. At no, I know you're right, movie. but that is so one of my it's like it just appears in the middle of the film. Yeah, which is strange. Uh, and I like that. Uh, yeah. I like that they did something different to it. Well, but. I mean, can we agree that like Shirley Bassey is the is the go-to. She is the go-to Bond. Uh, she's the ultimate Bond singer. You know? Yeah. I also have to. Well, I also have to give props to Tom Jones doing Thunderball. I, I, well, I yeah. love that. <laughs> and I mean, just, also, just to incorporate Thunderball in a song lyric is that cool. you know, <laughs> That I always. It, well, what it about takes Thunderball. Anthony Newley? <laughs> Anthony Newley's um for from Russia with Love. Yeah. That's interesting. That would never that would never register for me. I can never I can never I can never remember that mm-hmm. song. Unfortunately. No, but it's, well, a, it's a good one though. I like it. I love though. Duran Duran's of You to a Kill, actually. That's, that's a good a great, that's a great song. song. Um And yeah. and let's don't forget Live and Let Die, which is Live the last Die. bond mm-hmm. that's the last bond song to actually get nominated for the Oscar, I think. Or mm-hmm. maybe maybe not. It was For Your Eyes Only that was the last one. That was a good one. That's another good one. Yes. What do we think of and Adele's Skyfall? I, like I still it. haven't heard it yet, so it's good. Well, um, it's really trying. I mean, she's definitely trying to go for that Shirley Bassey kind of feel. It to sounds. It. it sounds like a throwback. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I like that. I think that's a, that was a, good, a smart move. I, I do too. It's pretty heavy on the sampling, though, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty heavy sampling. You know. Well, the they bond maintain theme. a lot of the bond bond themes. Yeah, I mean, it's it got it. It, you know it's a Bond song when you hear it. I mean, you really There's do. a part of the melody that I don't like in the chorus, but I think it's a strongly performed mm-hmm. song. Mm-hmm. We'll play we'll play it at the end of the show. Um, mm, okay. They're number 17. And, and keep in mind, <clears throat> they're number 17. They're still giving it a B- as okay. a grade. Mm. Uh, it's The Living Daylights. Yeah, I love all of those uh all of those Timothy Dalton. Yeah, ones. both uh, of Timothy you know, Dalton's are both, good. Both, yeah. Timothy Dalton was supposed to replace Connery when he was twenty four years old, but he was deemed too young, ultimately. Mm. 
Um, yeah, his, I, I think that his movies are are really tough. They they really tried to. I think they were really reacting to the sort of uh, art kind of humor that uh, Roger Moore had brought into well, the also uh, thing. Interesting. License to Kill really is a precursor to what they're trying to do with um, Casino mm-hmm. Royale. Uh-huh. With Daniel Craig. I mean, he really wanted to make a really tough, gritty character, and they did that with License to Kill. And unfortunately, it, it had the unfortunate to come out the summer of Batman and Lethal Weapon Two, and uh-huh. and it just it died at the box office, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. The number sixteen is Diamonds Are Forever. I love that. I love all the Connery ones, but I love that. One. <laughs> You know, I watched that on the big screen over at the Film Forum a few years ago, and I thought I was just kind of in the mood to go to Film Forum, and they're playing Diamonds Are Forever, so I said, oh, well, it's not one of my favorites, but I'll no, go but Jimmy see it Dean anyway. is a trip And in you that know movie. what? I, I had a really good time at it. I yeah. really, I, I really, I said, hey, this isn't so bad. This is, this is actually pretty dang fun, you know, all the way through, all that moon stuff and everything. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a really good time at it. He knew how to have fun with that towards the end. He really knew how to have fun with the character, I think. Yes. Their number 16 is The Man with the Golden Gun. That would be one of the ones that I'd put lowest on the, even lower, because I just, I find it difficult to get through that film. It's well, yeah, on Spike or TBS where it's shown for five hours, I can I, I, I admit that. But now that's a good, that's an interesting one because that has a lot. That's already where the show, the series is finding a lot of you know is starting to go into. We have to make this funny and maybe too funny because there's a lot of funny things. I mean, you have the sheriff that from Live and Let Die is there and. Um, oh, and they have the car chase. Uh, you know, it has a lot of great lines. And it goes to see Emma. Who would want me dead? Uh, you know, jealous husbands, sailors. So, who who would you choose as the best Bond villain? Oh, uh, Robert Shaw. Oh yeah, he was really good. He was really Robert good. Shaw uh, and Telly Savalas and Donald Pleasant. Oh, there you um, go. And Donald Pleasant's very good, and you only live twice as um. And Charles Gray was great. I mean, everyone who played Blofeld Kurt, in that early. Kurt Probe, you know, I like Kurt Probe. I think he's pretty good. Oh, he no, he's excellent. Um, and let's not forget, is it? It's Joseph Wiseman, right? As Doctor No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. He's superb. I mean, he's so monstrous. Those hands. I mean. <laughs> Do you know that yeah. one of the composers of the Bond theme? His name is Dick Flick. That was my porn name for a long time. That is not a made-up name. That is his I name. I realize that. I'm, no, I know that. Um, <laughs> that was my porn well, now, name. Well, wait. He's, 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 he, he composed the theme along with Monty Norman? He, 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 yeah. Yeah. Dick Flick. Huh. It was Dick the, it Flick was a, is my hero, man. Don't, it was don't. the two of them and John Barry. I mean, John Barry made it bigger. John Barry made it orchestral. Mm-hmm. Brought in all the uh-huh. bass and everything. Brass, not bass. Brought in all the fish. He brought in all the fish. <laughs> yeah, he brought in all the fish, man. The salmon, the swordfish, uh, the eels. Yeah. Uh, okay, number they're number fourteen, which I have to say, I might get criticized for it, but I can't help it. Tomorrow Never Dies is one of my favorite Bond movies. I I like that mm. movie, and it is one of the Bond movies that actually does not lag for me mm-hmm. in, in the midsection. Movie. Michelle Yeo, like great, and um, it, it Terry paired Hatton well with Michelle Yeoh, yeah, yeah. No, but that you know what I know what my, I actually do like that one. I love the I just love the chase of the BMW, you know, the BMW yes. chase. I think that was one of my favorite gadgets from that that Q gave him in that era. I love that with the cell phone and everything. Yeah, I thought that was very cool. I like it. Who was uh, the, what was the was that the, the one with Jonathan Price? Yeah, he's like a Ted yes. Turner like character. Yeah, that was the best of those of those uh, Pierce Brosnan things. It's too bad Pierce Brosnan and I really liked his Bond, but I never thought he got a really. I mean, I think movie, the yeah. best of all of his movies, but uh, but I don't think that he really got one that was just a knock out of the park kind he, of great. I always movie. felt that was unfortunate because he was born to play the character. I mean, he got screwed over by NBC when he was supposed to play it originally. He couldn't get out of the Remington Steel contract and. This is the man who, I mean, who is meant to play James Bond. Uh, I think so too. I mean, he's a great Bond. And Tomorrow Never Dies was a big success, uh, even though it did open the same day as Titanic. You know, 
but it was directed by Roger Spot as Wood. I a like great the one theme, that too. Gold a great Mine. theme song from Sheryl Crow. Uh, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I like it. I like uh, Mine th- a lot too. Let's see where it ranks here. They're number thirteen as Live and Let Die. Great boat chase. Great boat chase. Uh, great theme. Uh, pretty good. Pretty good villain in Yafet Kodo. And, oh, he's a, yeah. Uh, another one that's really good. Yeah, uh, and I, I like all that New Orleans stuff. But again, I hate. I I I really don't. I I find that I start cutting off with the Bond series when they get too funny. If they get too funny, too slapstick. Uh, like that stuff with Clifton James as the as the cra- as the country sheriff or whatever. But I love I, that. I, start, I love that I line. Switching off. <laughs> His first line is, "I've got me a regular banner cruising down the street here." <laughs> <laughs> okay, their number twelve is Doctor No. Doctor Noah. The, the original. Yeah. yeah. Wow, well, Doctor <laughs> No is that okay? Interesting because that's a really solid. Movie. I mean, that's a really. Just a they give it a B. Good, but you, but you feel that it's, you know, it's the first. So you feel like, you know, when you go back and, you know, you're already a Bond fan. Most people who go back and take a look at it, uh, they're already a Bond fan from seeing the later films, and so that film doesn't really have it. Uh, doesn't doesn't have everything together. Okay. You know, that's true. I mean, from that pr- perspective, you're absolutely right because the. Now I think all three of us probably remember the most the, we watched James Bond. I think it may be true for Dean and I really on ABC, um, you know Sunday night movies when they mm-hmm. would have them. Remember they would have them, and that was a big yeah. deal. This is before any cable and everything. So I remember the first one I watched in its entirety was You Only Live Twice on. Um, I was in the first. This is like seventy six, I guess. That was the first one I remember in its entirety, and then I remember they had like Doctor No on and all these. We watched them, but just remember it was inc- I've never seen anything like it. It was just amazing. Mm-hmm. This one surprises me. They're number eleven. As I remember, this movie was crucified when it came out, and the the majority of the criticism had to do with you know Roger Moore is way too old now, mm-hmm. and that that's a view to a kill. Mm-hmm. They give it a B plus. Number eleven. But Christopher Walken is such a great villain. That's probably yeah. why it's far, far He is there. insane. In and Grace movie. Jones is an interesting foe or, or an interesting element in it too. Yeah. Kind of exotic. And, and the Tanya opening Roberts, sequence on the Eiffel Tower. Tanya Roberts is a nondescript Bond girl, ironically though. That's the that's the thing at the time is like you're really caught off guard by what a nondescript Bond girl. Well, when I think of of you two kill, obviously the theme song. Yeah, that's uh, a big but, thing. But uh, t- uh, also too, the two big set pieces in the movie are pretty as grandiose as you can get. The Eiffel Tower in the beginning, mm-hmm. and the San Francisco Bridge at the end, the Golden Gate Bridge at right. the end. Yeah, that's pretty spectacular. The Golden Gate Bridge and the big blimp. Yeah. No, no, those <laughs> then, are those are very good. Um, it's I. It's his swan song. I, I think that's another reason. But you, ha- in hindsight, though, I think it's Walken's performance is so over. The- I mean, when they're when he takes he passes out the machine guns to the guys and they're killing all their own workers in the um, river, and he's just having a time of his life in that movie. Um, mm. I think that explains why it's so high up. Yeah, Christopher Walken's performance in it. Uh, number ten is License to Kill. They give it a B plus. I, I have no problem with that. I would put. I might actually put it higher, depending on you know. But I, I do think that's a really good one. Uh huh. They're number. They're number nine, which they claim is one of the most woefully underappreciated Bond films, is Octopussy. I agree with that completely. It's completely. a good film. It's another one with has a great opening, but it's got some great set pieces and. It's is she is Maud Adams the only only girl the actress no. to be in the series twice as different characters? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yes, she is. And you know we speak of God. He's another one. Louis Jordan is an awesome villain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and there's actually I got to say some real there's a real suspenseful moment in there when he has to disarm the bomb. That is a real edge of your seat moment. I have to give them props for that. At the circus. this movie. This movie was released four months before Never Say Never Again. Mm-hmm. You know, which is which is odd. 
Uh, All Time High was the theme song on it, Rita Coolidge. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Involved a Fabergé egg. I mean, how could you not like it? Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Number eight. <laughs> Number eight is uh, For Your Eyes Only. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think this is Roger Moore's best Bond movie. Hmm. Well, they might too. They might okay. think the same thing. I don't know yet. It's a great. It has a great line in it towards the end when he throws the ATAC. I think that's what it is. The ATAC device before the Russian Walter Gotel um, shows up, and he goes, "That's detente, comrade. You don't get it. We don't get it." It's you know great, what's interesting about Octopussy, actually, mm-hmm. uh, going back a little bit. Uh, I guess more they are doing contract. Contracting for the Bond mm-hmm. thing, and they're, uh, I guess they're trying to play hardball with him to come back. Mm-hmm. And so they started screen testing other people. One, and one of the people they screen tested was James Brolin, and that screen test is actually on the Blu-ray of Octopussy. That just oh, I, I, w- I, w- I would love to see that. Yeah, interesting. How did he? How do you think he did as, in his screen test? Do you think he would have made an interesting Bond? Eh. Possibly. Probably not. He's a little too American. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 it. I mean, yeah, what about yeah. Brian Brown? There was a time when they were casting. You know, after Roger Moore, there was talk of Brian Brown too. Yeah, around mm-hmm. SX or something like yeah. that. <laughs> but we like we like our Bond that who drinks his martinis. We just don't want one that looks like an alcoholic. There, there yeah. you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get into who we who we cast as Bond a little a little bit. Which I think all three of us probably agree that there's only one real contender for it, but we'll get into that in a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, number seventeen, uh, number seven rather. I'm so sorry. The Spy Who Loved Me. Now that's the best Roger Moore. You, I like that one a lot, but I'd have to go with I'd have to go with For Your Eyes Only uh, over that. You but that's a fun makes, one. It's so for much me, fun. What, well, for me, what makes that one so great is is its uh, is its opulent. Sort of, um, you know, of course, in, in the entire history of Bond films, you know, the word opulence in, it, in its uh, in, in talking about its production design is like, well, that's that's what they are. They are all that way. But there's something about the look of uh, Spy Who Loved Me. And they really mm-hmm. felt it really feels like they went they went like overboard, even. right? Like they just. It, it, that Ken Adam production design in that is so fascinating to look mm-hmm. at all the way through that uh, it really feels like it raises the movie up. Uh, I mean, I think that's the thing that I like about it best. Hmm. Their number six is Goldeneye. I will say this about Goldeneye. There's one thing that I flat out don't like about it, and that's Eric Serra's score. Really? Uh, okay. And and that he only brings in the Bond theme for a split second in, in one scene with the tank. That's the best. I, I think that's the best part of the movie, the tank chase. And where yeah. He, yeah, the um, tank chase. Uh, right. I like, but I do. I actually have to say, of all the Pierce Brosnans, that's my favorite um, of the four. Yeah. But like you guys said, he never got a movie totally fitting for him. Martin Campbell is a more than competent action director. I mean, he seems yeah, well, yeah. well fitted for right. Him. But um, that good Robbie, theme song, good Robbie theme song, Coltrane. written by Bono, performed by Tina Turner. It's a good theme song. I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. Uh, Martin Campbell came back for their number five, which is Casino Royale. No, it definitely it definitely deserves to be. I, I may I might actually be a little five. higher. Yeah. Yeah, I might too. Their number four. Is Thunderball interesting? That's that's surprising that that's so as high. Yeah, uh, this this kind of, is very curious. Go keep going, keep keep going now. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three more. <clears throat> At their number three, they put a George Lazenby on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Okay, this is my all-time favorite. Um, Bob. That would be the one that I think is the best as well. I think. This is a film, and it, you read. The, I think everyone's read the interview with. I think it was in EW actually was the interview. You know, he he lived after this movie. He lived at home with his mom in Australia. You know, he he never got the breaks he deserved. But he was a, he would have played it again. When I think of Bond, I think of this movie, and you know what? I'm not alone. You know whose favorite Bond movie this is? 
Ian Fleming? Christopher <laughs> Nolan. Mm. Oh, really? oh, yeah. And that show was in Inception, totally. Mm. Um, oh, yeah, especially with all the snow stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean he really... Yeah. He loves this movie, but no, I always felt this movie got a bum rap. I thought this is this is the, in, and in hindsight, and in you know, in, in retrospect, this is the fav- this movie's gained so much stature, um, as like really one of the best Bond films. Is, is Lazenby still alive? Yes. Yeah, he is. Oh yeah, he's been in. He's interviewed. He's still. He you can friend him on Facebook, I think. Oh wow! Ooh. I I sent a request to Roger Moore, but I didn't. I haven't, haven't sent one to Lazenby. Oh, he would be. A, oh, he would be a joy to talk to. Oh my God! Yeah. Um. Okay, this is um, the last movie that uh, JFK ever saw before his assassination. It was screened at the White House on November twentieth, nineteen sixty-three. Mm. Uh, three days before he was killed. Um. Number two from Russia with Love. This is a, I love this movie. Oh, it's so yeah. good, so good. It's the most romantic of uh, all uh-huh. of the Bond movies. I would say That's... this and Majesty, Majesty Secret Service would definitely be up um, a contender. But it's Robert's that scene in the train between him and Robert Shaw. I just Robert Shaw is so menacing in the movie. Um, and, and Sean Connery, everyone's real. Everyone is in top form in this movie. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's it's great. Their number one James Bond movie, of the course, the leading lady in the movie. They had to fight the MPAA to keep her character's name. You're right. Uh, Goldfinger. Yes. Yeah, that it's the it's the movie that set the standard for the whole series. I mean. It is the no pun intended the gold standard of James Bond. I mean, mm-hmm. it the is. gadgets, the girls, everything, um, the villains. It really set the stage um, for everything. Yeah, I mean the song, the credit sequence, the I mean, every everything is like all pistons are firing. I mean, the only reason that I would put. Uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service up above Goldfinger's because it actually does something different. Mm -hmm. It does something radically different with the series. But that said, I don't have any problem with putting Goldfinger in number one either. Because Neither do I. uh, It's also got the all-time great classic line from the Bond series, you know. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. I mean, that's you can't beat that. Yeah, I mean... It's got everything going for it. I mean, you, you that's really the, can't. That's, that's the ultimate, like, uh, you know, villain rejoinder, you know, yeah. something, yeah. you know. So it's okay, great. so two questions to close off the show. Two questions about James Bond. <clears throat> now, the series has had many directors. Michael App did Terrence Young, uh, John Glenn, uh, the, uh, who did Goldfinger, the... Um, uh, who was the director of Goldfinger again? Oh, that was a lot of... Uh, oh, gosh. It's, oh, God, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, Guy Hamilton, I think. Guy Hamilton. Guy Hamilton. Guy yeah. Hamilton did many of them, yeah. Martin Campbell. Who would you choose to direct a Bond movie? Because many big-timer directors have wanted their shot at it. Well, um, the obvious choices are... Well, Tarantino was supposed to direct one. John Woo would be an awesome choice. Now, we had a great action director... Um, Lee Tamori um, direct Die Another Day, and it didn't go so well. So I'm, I'm right. hesitant. But there's a bigger problem here. You could have the Tarantinos, the Nolans, the Woos. They, unless the the producers let these directors um, give them some breathing room, sure. it, it doesn't matter who directs it. Um, you really right. have to. You really. It's like when these. All right. How do I say? It? It's like when you're a popular writer. But you have to write, like, or a James Bond novel or a Star Wars or a Star Trek novel, whatever, a popular franchise. You have to play by the rules, unfortunately. You can't. Or, or even even a better analogy, Jerry, would be like, okay, so you're a, you're a director, you know, like Keith Gordon or whatever, yeah. going on to do an episode of a show like The Killing or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Or, or a big director like Mike Figgis going on to do some an episode of The Sopranos. Exactly. They can't put their personal stamp on an episode of The Sopranos mm-hmm. because 
really they have to work in conjunction with the creator of the show, and it's the creator of the show that has to keep the that has to keep the flavor of the series there and not have it overtaken by the director. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what you're facing here. Is, is yeah, that's uh, a big problem, and yeah. I don't know how you. Now, and in TV, it kind of makes sense. Now, you know, we all remember Tarantino directed an episode of ER, and that, that people remember that because it had some of his trademarks in it. CSI, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we, we remember these things. Um, but in this, the Bond, the, the, um, the producers are very, you know, let's say, or not even say Tarantino or John Woo, let's say, a, you know, Scorsese has always wanted to direct a James Bond movie. But are you going to give these these guys, these these mavericks, are you going to let them do what they want, or do they have to play in the rules? And Well, I think in some cases, I mean, I think that some of the big-time directors, Spielberg has expressed interest, Christopher mm-hmm. Nolan has expressed it. In Nolan would be an interest. awesome choice. I think Nolan would be a nice choice, but and I think in those two cases, I mean, I think they are inherently respectful of the franchise. They want right. to be part of it because they like the franchise, right? You know. But there's that. But there's also that other thing. You, you well, I, I agree with you absolutely. Especially with someone like Nolan, we would want them to, how should we say, it, almost go outside the box. Sure. Almost. Yeah. There's a part of us that wants that too. But these are all great choices. It just depends what they can do, what they can bring to it. Well, look, Sam Mendes is a heck of a filmmaker. We'll see. He he is. That's going to be he the is. But I, I, I do think I do think that the the uh, Bacoli family, I guess they're still controlling the franchise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do think that they're incredibly protective of of uh, what kind of voices come into the franchise and, yeah. they, and I, I don't think that they would permit anybody to come in and, and really, uh, and really, really take go a, nuts with it. Drastic, mm-hmm. drastic. Well I think that's probably probably why they've gone to people like Sam Mendez and Michael Apted because they're uh-huh. accomplished, accomplished British directors and yet they've never attempted something on this kind of a massive scale so yeah. they, they, they'd they just be focused on keeping their head above the water mm-hmm. and not necessarily you know, making something Rocking revolutionary. The yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Actors. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. I, if Daniel Craig, I think he just signed on for two more Bonds. After his run is over, uh, would it be time for for Michael Fassbender to step up? Oh, yes. And it would be time for him. There's the other one who played, the guy who plays um, Loki in the Avengers and Thor, Tom Hilderson. There's a lot of people who would love to see him play Bond. There's a whole, he has a huge fan base. Um, let me ask you this: Has the expiration set in for people like Clive Owen and Jason Statham? No, they're they're. they're I think they're. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think no, that's I, what I mean. I is, is their time expired as choices? I mean, you. We don't really see them either. One of them that because at the time before Daniel Craig, they were especially Clive Owen. I mean, Clive Owen was such a shoe, and they thought in that they have he has a cameo in the uh, Steve Martin Pink Panther film as a James Bond like character. Uh huh. So, um, I just I don't think you're going to get a better choice than Michael Fassbender unless no, you go to somebody like unless you go to somebody like DJ Qualls. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be, he'd be an amazing Bond. <laughs> now there was talk, that would be thinking outside the box right there. There was talk <laughs> though a couple months ago or maybe a couple of years ago. Um, who is the actor? Um, what's his name? Who played uh, in the British series Luther, but he was in Prometheus. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, um, I don't. And he, wasn't he also in The Wire? Um, mm-hmm. To I don't know his name off the top of my head. It's, it's slipping me. My Alzheimer's kicking in, so um, I don't know. Um, but I know he was. How about, how about is it time for a black James Bond? That's who I'm talking about. That's um, Idris Elba. Yes, he would be awesome. Yeah. He, he would, would be, be good. incredible. Hmm. Why not? Interesting. Why not Interesting. a black James Bond? Well, they <laughs> talked about now. Now, um, when they were remember, after License of Kill did so poorly, um, Cubby wanted to sell the rights. He wanted to get rid of it. He was so despondent, and no one would buy it from them. They're like, "This is your thing. You have to keep this. You have to keep this. Is you, this is your thing." Because there was talk of turning it in 
to a, a TV series at one point um, mm-hmm. in this hiatus they had between License to Kill and Goldeneye. There was um, so it's in, it's interesting. 